Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, SSB uh, Ground School Series. Uh, tonight, we're going to have a ground school session on uh, collision avoidance, and that is ADSB, uh, FLARM, uh, and some other systems. A um, couple things I'd like to go over before we, we get started, a couple announcements uh, that pertains to the club. Um, one is that uh, the um, Proving Grounds board is up on the shack. It's on the uh, on the east side of the shack, right next to the picnic table, so we can see it. We're looking forward to seeing a bunch of names go up on there, but uh, it's up and it's working. Uh, WorkFest uh, was a great success. Um, somebody did a great job cleaning out the shack. I'm not sure who, but thank you very much. Uh, we've got new Flarms in the DG and the K21, and so thanks to Bob um, Ferris for doing that. Uh, we still need to do some work on the K21. Uh, we need to get some wires uh, underneath, and the Rat Patrol uh, needs to be called in to uh, uh, vacuum. We'll, we'll remove the seat pans and uh, and vacuum that out, and hopefully that'll help uh, help with the uh, mouse situation. That was. Uh, uh, I, I'm finding evidence of the mice on the uh, seat of the uh, rear, on the rear seat, which uh, is not uh, my favorite thing to find. Um, Sayu is now the youth representative on the board. Uh, he's not, I haven't seen him join here right now, but uh, he's doing a great job and uh, um, working through and get, just getting closer to, to solo. Uh, uh, Joe Brock is working on putting in a base station uh, at the shack so that we can all, people sitting around at the picnic table and uh, around the shack can hear uh, what's going on on the, on the, uh, on the CTAF. Uh, and, and that'll help with not pushing, you know, alerting members to not push out if somebody's on downwind. Um, Colin is working on installing a uh, open glider network. Uh, turns out that, uh, you know, it's not quite as easy as, as we would all hope it would be. Uh, but uh, Colin, I spoke to him a little while ago, and uh, he is not, uh, he's not going to yield. He's going to make sure it happens. So uh, we will eventually have that in place. Uh, Elliot Dickerson is putting together a mini camp uh, that will be at Boulder uh, and run only through May 24th through the 31st. Um, and there'll be a bunch of activities in that, uh, including weather briefings in the morning, uh, uh, tasks to fly. Um, we're going to do some ground schools the night before. They'll either be on Zoom or, or maybe in, maybe we'll do it like it's, you know, we'll have ground schools like it's, you know, 2019. Um, our Pawnee is tugging better than, than uh, ever since I've joined the club. And that's because uh, Gary Stubbe put a new prop on it. Uh, really, there's there's a market performance in the in the uh, in the Pawnee. So thanks a lot, Gary. Um, moving right along to our our session here, um, uh, we, we've got two speakers tonight. Uh, Bill Kaywert is going to talk about the systems uh, for collision avoidance. And then as we, as he rolls on through his presentation, um, Alistair Moses is going to chime in and talk about antennas, which is, of course, uh, an important part of, uh, of using these systems. And glider antennas, uh, as those of you who have private ships know, uh, can be pretty tricky. And, you know, you think, you go, well, okay, stick the antenna on, it's going to work. Well, maybe. Uh, maybe not. And uh, so uh, we'll do that. And we will be, uh, op the, the, the two of them will be open to questions. Um, uh, kind of let Bill get the bulk of his presentation done and Alistair as well, but uh, they're, they're willing to take questions on the fly here. Uh, so those of you, especially those of you with private ships uh, may have questions. Um, so I'm, I'm going to introduce these uh, our two speakers, uh, Bill Kaywert, uh, he earned his private glider license in Boulder back in 1998 and immediately drawn to cross country flying 
uh, being coached, of course, by um, by Alfonso, uh, and he and received mentoring uh, out of Boulder and elsewhere in the Mountain West. Um, Bill received hard knocks at schooling, and <laughs> including numerous landouts. So uh, he's got a little landout experience. Um, he he admits to a ground uh, to a gear up landing um, and a near out landing in uh, the snow west of the divide. Uh, so, uh, but he but he earned it while he was getting a silver badge duration flight. I, I think he all, he I know he does have a silver. I'm not sure if he got it on that flight or not. Um, but he earned, he earned his gold badge and has completed a few glider contests without incident. Uh, he placed first in the 2004 Region 9 sports class contest in Hobbs, New Mexico. Uh, he failed to uh, mention in this write-up that he gave me that the reason he won that was because everybody else landed out and uh, his conservative line paid off to get him, the, get him on the podium. Uh, uh, and he's always learning from Boulder pilots and uh, uh, both in real time and on OLC and, uh, and uh, we're very thankful that he'll be a part of uh, the ground schools. Uh, Alistair uh, Moses will follow in. Uh, he got his sailplane rating in 2014 or started in 2014, got his license the following year in 2015 and then joined the club in 2016. Uh, he's flown 233, the Grove 103, 102, K21, 505. Um, he he bought and restored a older glass Fugel uh, 304, a, a 1981 model. Uh, and uh, for those of you who have seen it and seen the work that he's done on it, um, it's hard to believe that it's a it's an 81 model. Uh, he's got it in perfect shape. Right now, he's working on a helicopter rating. Uh, so we haven't seen that much of them last year. Uh, that helicopter rating really sharpens up pilots. I've trained uh, two pilots who uh, had helicopter ratings and they learned to tow faster than anybody uh, I've seen. Um, Alistair has a PhD in mechatronics systems, uh, including radar collision avoidance. Uh, for unmanned aircraft. So he, he's an expert in this area. We're very pleased to have him. Uh, he works for, Col for Qualcomm uh, on hush hush DOD projects. So we really don't know what he's working on. He can't tell us and won't. We sure don't really want to dig too deep into that, but uh, we're glad he's on our side and not uh, uh, working for the Chinese or the Russians. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bill and Bill. Uh, Please uh, tell us about these systems and, and how they're gonna help us uh, see and avoid each other. Will do. If you would uh, enable the sharing of the screen, that would be great. Uh, what Armand failed to mention about that Hobbs contest is that I also landed out. Oh. But if you land out on, if you land out on a practice day, it doesn't count. So if you're going to land out at a contest, do it before the, the, uh, the actual scoring starts. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, what uh, what I'm here to talk about is the uh, is farm and uh, and ADSB out uh, practical applications. The first three slides are messed up, thanks uh, to uh, Microsoft. Um, so you won't you won't see anything on the on the on the second slide here. Um, but what it says is that uh, Boulder is a it's a high threat environment for mid-air collisions. And, and so what, what that means is we have a lot of different uh, types of aircraft here. We have uh, jets and other commercial aircraft uh, uh, on both approach and departures at the altitudes at which we fly. Um, we have um, general aviation, a lot of general aviation aircraft, especially on the weekends. This is a, a pretty affluent area. Lots of people have planes. A lot of, and, and there is some funneling of that uh, GA traffic between the Denver Class B and the mountains. And so there's, there, there all, there's always uh, power traffic overflying the Boulder area. Um, we have uh, paramotors, um, uh, paragliders. Um, there's there uh, in the fall, early, late summer and early fall, we've got uh, firefighting operations, we've got TFRs. 
So it's it's a pretty busy area, and it's I, I would I would guess it's one of the busiest uh, traffic environments in the country. Um, one of the uh, one of the sad uh, realities of this is that mid-air collisions do occur. Uh, this is one that that included a glider. <clears throat> um, one of our club members told me a story some years ago where he was involved in a mid-air um, during his uh, landing pattern. Um, and there were two uh, GA aircraft flying in formation that were not monitoring CTAF. One of them uh, got crossways with this pilot and uh, ended up in the lake at the end of the of uh, the runway in Boulder and uh, lost his life. So it's it, it it's a, a very challenging environment. So I'm gonna I think I'm back to the slides that that should work well. Bill, oh yeah, never mind. Yep, you did it. Is it uh, showing? Yes, I was just telling you you didn't have it on full screen and you do now. Thank you. Okay. So, so our, I want to talk about our goals, but before we go to goals with avionics, the, we, we have to first assume that we were all taught that uh, keep your head on a swivel, look out of the cockpit. But unfortunately, our eyes and our brains are, are limited and we, we don't have perfect perception. And so really the point of this, this discussion and the whole technology is to, is to augment our vision, not to replace it. And so the first thing, uh, of our goals is we, we want to see and uh, so other aircraft so that we can avoid them. And of course, we want to be detected by the others so that they can avoid us uh, if we don't see them. So here, here are, I'm not going to read the slide. You, you can read it, but the, the essence is there, there are four types of threats. The last one, there's nothing that electronics will do to deal with the, the paragliders. But the commercial aircraft, in, in some sense, uh, are the easiest to deal with because it, it, either a mode C or a mode S transponder will is effective at, at uh, avoiding collision. There's been one incident that I'm aware of uh, near Minden where the pilot did not have his transponder operating and he got he got involved with a business jet. I think everybody survived, but that's something nobody wants to repeat. Other gliders, uh, that, that was really the intent of power form that we'll be talking about in detail. Um, glider collisions occur. Um, they, they can occur. Uh, they, when you think about where gliders fly and why they fly, we're, we're often on the same energy lines, um, all at similar altitudes sometimes, uh, certainly when we're cruising. Uh, and at a contest, when you think about turn points, there are gliders entering and exiting turn points often under reciprocal courses. And so it's, it's, a, it's actually a pretty high threat environment and people have uh, been in collision, some have survived, others have died. Power general aviation aircraft, um, the, the power form can help with them, um, but we're gonna talk about why um, something called a, an ADSR or TISB upgrade uh, can really help. And, um, but, but I, I, would, I would posit that the powered GA aircraft are actually one of the highest threats. And in fact, the, the, most of the collisions in the Boulder area have been between gliders uh, and um, powered GA aircraft. So the, my, my takeaway from this is that if you're gonna fly in the Boulder area uh, and be a responsible pilot, you absolutely should fly with a transponder, which is useful against the, the, the commercial aircraft threat and essential against them if you're going to fly, um, fly anywhere near their, uh, the altitude of, of the approach routes. And you need to be farm equipped to uh, reduce your collision risk with other gliders. So that, again, we have a another slide uh, with a lot of text on it. The purpose of this is so that people can actually uh, look at, at that, this text at a later time, but FLARM, you see, uh, see other FLARM aircraft, it provides a collision alarm uh, function, and it's very important for, for high density airspace like ours and uh, most glider uh, contests uh, mandate power FLARM. Then we have two types of transponders. We talked a little bit about them 
The mode C transponder is, is obsolete in, uh, in non-glider aircraft. You can still use it in a glider. The, the, it, when it comes to, to jets and other commercial aircraft, the, the, um, the sur secondary surveillance radar will, will allow the jet's TCAS systems to work uh, and, and avoid you. The TCAS is a very, very effective system. And then we get into ADSB out. This is a the, the overview of this. This is that it it supersedes um, ground-based surveillance radar, and the, and the essence of it is that the the ADSB enables the, each aircraft to self-determine its position and then broadcast that both directly to other aircraft and also to ground stations. Uh, in practice, in a glider, uh, not only can you see ADSB equipped pilots much further away than you could with FLARM, but it also improves accuracy of, uh, of the general aviation aircraft warnings. And finally, ADS-B in um, is a receiving function, whereas ADS-B out is only transmit. So what, what ADS-B in allows you to do is, is, if you have the receiver, is to receive in a native function both different standards of ADS-B that are used in the US. I, I, I learned uh, this weekend of one uh, glider pilot who, who does uh, equip with ADS-B in and FLARM and ADS-B out. Um, it, it, we didn't have time to chat about it in detail, but it, it was intriguing. So uh, these are color coded, just the, the, the FLARM, all the FLARM slides are this orange color, the transponder is blue, and then the ADS-B out slides are green. That's why you're gonna see different colors. So getting to power farm, um, here, is, here is what it can do. It, it, your farm uh, knows its own position using GPS, and it has an algorithm to predict your own future flight path. It then broadcasts your, your, uh, that predicted flight path to other gliders in the vicinity. Simultaneously, it's receiving uh, that same flight path information from other gliders. It's also receiving information from uh, ADSB out uh, 1090ES, which is one of the two ADSB standards. Um, it's also receiving uh, information from UAT targets, that's the other ADSB out scheme, uh, via uh, this uh, ground station relay. It, it predicts based on its own future flight path and the other aircraft's flight path, uh, collision risk, and if that risk is high enough, it sounds an alarm. So when you when you look at this list of things, um, it should give you an appreciation for what a marvelous innovation this really was, and um, it, it's 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 really provided a material a safety improvement to the glider community. It, it's, it, it is, a, I think it's a phenomenal invention. There are two versions of Power Flarm. Uh, one is no longer sold, but it's, um, it's installed in, you know, most of the Flarms available uh, are out in the fleet today are the, the original Power Flarm core. And then there's a newer one called the Fusion. The, and this, this table really summarizes the differences. Um, Starting with the A antenna, they, they both receive and transmit on the A antenna. On the B antenna, in the legacy uh, product, I learned the hard way that um, you have to pay extra money to enable the B antenna to actually work, but it only receives on the legacy core. In the Fusion, it both, the B antenna both receives and transmits as standard. Um, the the uh, ADSR and TASB. Uh, function is optional in, in the legacy and it's standard in the in the fusion. There's a range analyzer, which we're going to talk about. Um, it's easier to get out in the new one. Um, it's easier to, to, to upload and download files. Um, and my opinion, based on electronics uh, hardware design, is that the new one should be substantially more reliable because it is uh, only a single circuit card instead of three interconnected units.
So there, I, we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, alphabet soup, um, and we'll learn what ADSR and TISB are uh, a little bit more in the ADSB section. But the first thing we need to know is that there are two different standards for ADSB out in the country. The, the first is called uh, 1090 ES. 1090 is the megahertz frequency at which MODES transponders operate. And the way the, AD, the ADSB out system works is there, there is a, a, a signal piggybacked onto the, the transponder signal that, that carries the ADSB out payload. And so that, that was a natural uh, and very logical way to, um, to architect the, the, the data packets. For whatever reason, and I'm sure some of the other guys on the call could tell you more why, there was a competing standard called UAT. I don't know what it stands for, but it operates at a different frequency. It is theoretically capable of a, of a richer data payload, <clears throat> but unfortunately it's not compatible. And everywhere else in the world, they only use 1090, but here in the US, we have two standards. What that means is that the FLARM, which is a, uh, a European device, uh, was, was really only designed for 1090. It, it, it doesn't detect UAT targets. And so that, that's a problem for us in the glider community because the GA traffic, we've, we've already talked about, they're, they're arguably the highest risk for mid-air collision. But most of the GA, GA aircraft are equipped with UAT instead of 1090 ES. What that means is that our wonderful power farm cannot see GA targets. And so unless we, we buy this upgrade for the power farm or, or, or get the farm fusion, and I'm not a salesman for farm, even though it might sound like I am, um, we're not going to see general aviation targets. And so that's tantamount to saying the riskiest targets are invisible to us. I don't think that's a good idea. So that this that's the argument for for buying the ADSR TISB upgrade because it now it 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 makes the uh, UAT targets uh, rather more visible than they were before. One of the next things, uh, once we're equipped with FLARM, we have to verify that, that the FLARM is functioning properly. And believe me, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, it, it's something which uh, a lot of people um, are not, not attending to. And so here, here's what a, uh, there, there's something called a range analysis tool that's on the FLARM website. And the way you use it is you, you uh, download the IGC file from your power farm, and then uh, submit it to the farm website range analysis tool. And what you get back is something that looks like this, where it, it, it shows a pictorial diagram of the, the range that your farm is being detected by other aircraft. And in, in this particular instance, uh, which is from uh, an aircraft that I was flying in 2019, it shows satisfactory performance. Um, the other, one of the things, uh, mo most important things is that uh, ahead of the glider, uh, straight ahead, we have a greater range than behind us. And that's important because when you are closing uh, at 250 knots with another glider, uh, you, you're not going to see them until the very last minute, which gives you insufficient time to react. And so you want as much uh, uh, head notice as possible. So this is good. There are no apparent blind spots. In contrast, this analysis is very bad. Uh, it shows that the, the range is, is uh, in the unsafe zone in every direction. Um, it also shows that there was no B antenna installed. And, and, and this is in a different glider where I actually um, uh, paid the, uh, the, the avionics installer to install the FLARM and the B antenna, and, and I thought he knew what he was doing. Uh, turns out that, that we, we all made some mistakes. And so I, I want to walk you through my frequent, frequent failure program in FLARM. 
So the first uh, the first reason that that we didn't we didn't have the B is that we didn't know we needed to buy the B antenna license. So we bought it. Well, another problem was that the uh, the A antenna in this two place glider was installed behind the front pilot. Uh, apparently, the the frequencies at which Flarm transmits uh, the human head. Uh, I've, I've been told by some people is a good absorber uh, of that very low energy that Flarm transmits. So we relocated the A antenna uh, in front of the pilot front glare shield. Um, let's see, we had uh, we had some some suspected issues with the A antenna being co-located near the aircraft's ADS-B GPS antenna. And uh, we, we didn't know that was causing a problem, but, but the relocated A antenna um, reduced the cross radiation from both of those an antenna. In fact, the ADSB antenna doesn't radiate, it's only a receiver, but uh, if there was any, any interference, we, we reduced that. Uh, then, then the B antenna still appeared not to be working very well. Well, it turns out that, that the, uh, the B antenna's ground connection was in firm contact with fiberglass. And, and that's because the, you know, it's, it was a carbon fiber fuselage, but uh, there was a fiberglass fixture inside to which the uh, antenna ground connection was secured. Well, fiberglass is a really poor electrical conductor. So we, we improved that by by uh, counterboring into the carbon, partially into the carbon fiber fuselage, so that we could we could uh, access raw carbon fibers. That that should improve things. But I learned recently that it would have been much better to put a metal ground plane in there. Um, the next problem was the glider detected itself as a collision threat. That's not very good because you can't collide with yourself. And uh, I had gotten some bad. Uh, Bad advice from one of the uh, uh, glider supply uh, suppliers uh, that I should uh, you know, do do a certain thing to my configuration file, and uh, I, I I what I learned out of this is don't trust the uh, guys who are not experts. So I, I just went to the Florm configurator and had the, the the machine configure my my configuration file, and that seemed to work better. And then. I still had rotten reception range and rotten transmit range. Well, it turns out in this less than one year old power farm uh, core that I had a defective circuit board. It wasn't totally failed. It was just delivering about 5% of the power that it was designed to. So I, th this, this might alarm some of you. It, it certainly alarmed me and it frustrated me, but uh, that's really one of the, the motivators for me for actually talking about this is that the systems are great in theory, but uh, at least with the pre previous generation power form, it, it's, it, it's not been easy. And as Alistair will, will help you appreciate in a little while, you have to pay attention to antenna performance. Uh, takeaways. <laughs> Don't assume your flarm is working all right. And I've learned to assume it's not working. And there's some things that you can do uh, to test the flarm. So you, 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 for instance, when you turn on your, your avionics, uh, verify that you can see other ships on the field and, and uh, at the very least get on the radio and uh, talk to your buddy uh, across the field and say, hey, can you see my, my, my flarm transmission? Uh, there, there's some, you know, I heard another idea yesterday that sounds uh, absolutely excellent in terms of what, what some other things we can do to test on the airport. Uh, Alistair might talk about those later. Check your antenna connections. Uh, they can come loose, they can come un, uh, unscrewed, and don't bend them. Uh, some of these plastic antennas can break internally. Uh, we talked about that. Regularly check uh, Florent performance using the range analyzer tool. That's something which, which uh, when I went back and looked at the analysis over, over time last year, there was a deterioration that I did not notice uh, little by little, but it, it, it was in fact real. And that was probably my, my uh, power flarm circuit card going bad little by little. Firmware, 
farm uh, firmware expires. It only lasts uh, a year, and so you need to reload a new version of that each spring. Uh, check your config file is correct. And after I can't see after checking everything else, send your farm in for service. Unfortunately, the older design uh, power farm cores uh, do tend to fail. I I don't think I've talked to any pilot who has not suffered a farm core failure. Um, here, here's another midair story about not verifying farm performance, how, how it can be fatal. Um, this, this, this instructor and his student um, were, were apparently depending on farm. The tow plane had a farm, but his farm was flaky and wasn't functioning right. So, it, you know, this, this should be one of those things you should remember is make sure your equipment is working. This is a safety, a uh, safety vital uh, uh, component if you have it. And if you don't have it, I would encourage you, you get it. It's not that expensive and it, it is, is incredibly useful. Okay, we're, <clears throat> I wanna move into, uh, into the uh, uh, larger aircraft um, navigation systems because they do relate to us. The legacy um, air traffic control system was something called sur uh, primary and secondary surveillance radar. And, and this is a system where uh, we have a, a radar signal from the ground that is um, uh, ranging uh, and pinging uh, aircraft and the transponder in the aircraft responds with its uh, identification information. And so the, the aircraft position is determined by, by the surface assets. The, the ADSB system changed that logic kind of on its head because it, it, it now relies on the aircraft itself to determine its position and then report that position independent of the ground station. So what the diagram shows is even though this aircraft is, is transmitting its, its position to uh, the ADSB ground station. Um, that ground station is not required for other aircraft to see where each ADSB out aircraft is located. There is direct transmission that, that is moving from uh, each, each ADSB out equipped aircraft to other aircraft in the vicinity. And so that, that enables uh, very quick and very accurate uh, positioning of all ADSB out equipped aircraft. Uh, I talked about the two different uh, standards a little while ago. And, and so the next slide here really discusses um, what's called ADSR. ADSR is ADS, uh, R is for rebroadcast. And so we have, we have two different standards. And the if you have ADSB, well, um, forget ADSB in for a minute. Basically, each uh, in addition to transmitting to other aircraft, each of our ADSB out transmitters is communicating with the ground station, and the ground station will receive either 1090 or UAT, and it will rebroadcast that signal to other aircraft in the vicinity. It will rebroadcast both standards, so that uh, if if it's a UAT, it will it will able to be uh, it it actually rebroadcast re that information. Now, we we can't see our, our form cannot see a UAT target, and we can and, and the non-equipped would be let's say an aircraft with a mode C transponder. We can't see them. And so this, this rebroadcast, um, the ability to see uh, the rebroadcast signal is what the uh, ADSBR TISB upgrade enables us to see is that signal from the ground station. So TISB, this diagram is, is nearly identical to the other one, but it just shows that the radar, uh, secondary surveillance radar on the ground is processed by the ground station, converted to ADSB. Uh, information and then broadcast uh, to both the U UAT and the 1090 ES clients. So it, what it's doing is reporting the position of transponder equipped aircraft, even though they might not be 
equipped with ADS-B out. So here are some of the benefits of uh, ADS-B out in gliders. So first of all, if you have ADS-B out, you can now be detected by GA aircraft that have ADS-B in. And since they don't use FLARM, that could be an important anti-collision benefit. Second, the uh, ADS-B rebroadcast in the TISB system become more accurate if you are an ADSB client. And, and you become an ADSB client by equipping with ADSB out. So what happens is you're you're essentially registered on the ADSB system if you have uh, if you have ADSB out. You get and and one of the, the, the real practical benefits, now imagine that you're in busy airspace. You could get two different targets, for example, you could get both an ADSBR and a TISB data independently of each other for the same single aircraft. And that could create confusion. That does not happen if you are an ADSB out client. You would only get one target instead of two for the same aircraft. Um, the third, third benefit is you can see other gliders that are ADS-B out equipped can be seen much further away, like tens of miles, or sometimes even further, um, much further than the FLARM transmission. So <clears throat> if you have a marginally performing FLARM, but you're also transmitting ADS-B out, you can, uh, you can be seen at, at, a, at a much further range by other gliders. And, that, and if you can just imagine flying fast under a cloud street at 17 and a half thousand feet um, on the same line as somebody else, that you're going to be closing awfully fast. You want as much um, warning as you can get. And of course, the last benefit is, is that when guys like BC or, or ADSB out or equipped, we can see where, where he's, he's finding the lift and perhaps head in that direction, hoping we, we can find the same lift. Um, and this is really getting close to the end, but there, there are a couple of rules governing ADSB out. They're different for a standard certificated, certificated glider. Um, it, it, you have to, the GPS antenna and the GPS source are, are, are TSO and they're more expensive. I don't know if they're any more accurate, but they do allow you to use uh, software integrity level three, which is, is the full on, you get apparently all the privileges of, of the ADSB out system. Um, <clears throat> if you have a, an experimental glider, you can use under a different um, scheme called tabs rather than the, that AFS policy. <clears throat> Lower cost, smaller GPS antenna and source, um, but you have to use a SIL-1 transponder setting. Presumably the SIL-3 transponder setting allow, uh, enables a, a somewhat more accurate uh, positioning, but I, I'm not a, an authority on that part of it. <clears throat> so I would summarize uh, the recommendation for, for FLARM and ADSB most emphatically to fly with both a FLARM and a transponder. Um, equip with the ADSB, ADSR and TISB upgrade and regularly analyze your FLARM performance. And, and if you really want to go the full, the full um, getting, getting absolute best anti-collision results, uh, ADSB out does provide some marginal benefit because you're, you're going to be more visible to GA aircraft and it will improve reliability of, of the uh, rebroadcast system by making you a, an ADSB client. And this would be a good time for uh, questions. We, we crashed through this pretty quickly. But, uh, we can either start with questions here or, or uh, Armand, uh, as, as you wish, move on to Alistair. Um, does anybody have uh, questions, comments? Uh, concerns, anything that uh, Bill went over that um, you might be able to add something to or, or, or ask about? 
please just unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, Bill, I have a Phil Eklund, I have a question for you. Sure. <clears throat> Is there any way, like in uh, air traffic control controllers, can limit the height boundaries that they're looking at? They can set like a thousand above their area or a thousand below their area. So when you're looking at these devices, you have it just takes in all airplanes regardless of altitude or, you, uh, or distance above you or below you. You, you can limit the, the distance um, horizontally and uh, vertically by uh, changing parameters in your configuration file. So if, if you want to see jets at high altitude, you can see them. If you want to filter that stuff out, it's, it's, it's the user's choice. It's my thought the the more you can filter out, that's not going to be a collision factor, the safer it is. Good point. Hi, Bill. I had, I had one question. Uh, is this what is currently equipped on all the club gliders? Um, the the K21 I can speak to uh, is equipped with a uh, power floor. Uh, and it has a Flarm viewer in both the front and the back cockpits. Um, this has just been upgraded from a, a portable Flarm that was only visible in the front cockpit. Um, and thanks, thanks to Bob for, for making that happen. Um, it does not have ADS-B out, but I would, I would argue for the K21, that's probably not a, a, as important because most of its flights are, are, are quite local. However, Again, the argument for it is, you know, if, if GH air traffic can, can, can see us, if we're ADSB out equipped, then um, it's, it's, uh, it could, you know, there, there's some marginal safety benefit there. Um, we did have a discussion this winter about the possibility of, of, a, uh, of ADSB out. The cost for Standard certificated aircraft and ADSB outs probably going to be in the range of two and a half thousand um, dollars. It, it requires a new transponder um, and, uh, and some other stuff. We what we decided this winter was let's let's get put in this new ADSBR TISB upgrade capability, which literally only came became available a few months ago. It's brand new. Let's see how that works and, uh, and, and, and install that improvement now and reevaluate this time next year whether uh, ADSB out is warranted or not. Great, thanks. Um, I have one question. Uh, really, I, I saw that Steve Kapner is on. Steve's an airline pilot. Uh, Steve, can you speak to the um, key cast systems that are in the um, in those aircraft in the uh, uh, transport category aircraft, and and what do you see in that in that system? Uh, you know, with ADSB, can you see the gliders and all that? Um. We can see anything that's transponder equipped. Um, if it's mode S transponder, then our TCAS will react and give us a, uh, a command to either climb or descend. So any, any collision avoidance is vertical only. It's not horizontal. It's not lateral. Um, so if it's mode S equipped, it'll tell us to climb or descend and it, it can actually reverse itself. So it can tell you to climb initially and then if it sees something above you it can tell you to descend or it can tell you to level off um, but the the uh, in order for it to do that it has to be um, for the two airplanes to talk to one another it has to be mode s equipped but i think we i think tcas will still avoid a mode c equipped transponder aircraft it just can't communicate with that aircraft Hey, Steve, what is the uh, what is the vertical separation that uh, that you're advised to keep with um, commercial air traffic and gliders? Uh, 
Well, actually, the collision avoidance is provided by the air traffic controller because we're an IFR airplane. Um, obviously, see and avoid, you know, comes into play too. If you see something, you got to avoid it. But primarily, um, because we're always in controlled airspace, the controller is providing us with separation, and that's why. Um, that's why they won't let you go in a, into a class B airspace without a without a uh, a clearance because once you're in class B airspace, the controller is going to keep you separated. Yeah, and no, I mean I'm, I'm basically talking about like you fly by Estes Park and I'm at seventeen thousand feet, and there, there's lots of air traffic, obviously uh, commercial air traffic. So um, and sometimes they get a little closer than I think there should be but i to be honest, to be honest i don't know where how much how much separation they, they're actually advised to, to you keep. know it depends on the airspace and and i don't know the parameters i know that in in route airspace the the separation criteria are much greater than in terminal airspace so for example if you're flying an approach into san francisco um in some of the busier airports that's all airline traffic um, they have a waiver and they can actually get you uh, keep they can also they can actually allow you to be much closer than they can in other airspace um, because all the traffic's commercial and it's in class B airspace. Um, I think in 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 approach airspace it can be as close as two and a half miles and and I think with the dispensation, um, the, and I'm not an air traffic controller, but I think when they look at their um, radar screen, as long as the targets don't merge, that's legal. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know targets not merging. I don't know how close that would be. Um, the other thing that comes into play is if it's if the conditions are visual, and the controller points out the air traffic to us, and we say we have it in sight, he'll say maintain your own separation um, on the approach. And he's allowed to do that once you see the other aircraft. Hey, Steve, I have a good question for you. Yeah. So if you're under ATC control in class A or class B, and mm -hmm. you get a, a TCAS alert that tells you to do something opposite from what the controller tells you to do, uh, does your TCAS trump your behavior rather than... Uh, it does. Okay. It does. It does. Um, but that being said, um, for example, if the controller has given you a turn and he says turn to uh, heading 360 and then you get a TCAS, which is vertical only, you continue the turn and comply with the TCAS. Got it. Thank you. But but TCAS does does trump the controller vertically. Okay. Any uh any other uh, questions? Uh, if not, we'll uh, and and I'm not trying to stop the questions. Uh, just does anybody else have a question? Yeah, one, one more question for Bill. Uh, um, the, the, on your config file, the setting on your config file that was wrong, that had to be fixed, what was that? It was the location of the aircraft's uh, hexadecimal radio identifier. Uh, the position, uh, the line number in the, in the config file is relevant. It has to be in a particular location. Otherwise, uh, if you have ADSB out, the, uh, the, the there's no suppression of the alarm for that radio. Got it. Yeah, but I mean, if you do the config, if you do, if you fill out the configuration tool, and you put in the hex number in the right spot, it should be correct, right? Yeah. If you if you let the computer build the config file, you're okay. If you let you let the uh, the the glider the glider equipment salesman help you out, you're going to get into trouble. Okay. Okay, doing my own. Hey, this is uh, Jeff. I just have one quick thing to add. Uh, the discussion with uh, avoiding airliners made me think of uh, military aircraft. I haven't flown military in years, so I don't know what what their standards are now, but 
um, do uh, be aware of that too. They may not have the same standards and they may not have the same equipment, especially if you're operating in a, in a military operating area or somewhere where there's a, well, presumably we'd be up higher, but low level routes, there's very high speed aircraft and um, they probably won't see you. So they won't see what, will they not see anything? I mean, if we have, what, what, did you know, this would be really important actually, if we fly through a MOA, uh, what do we have to have uh, when we fly through a MOA that military aircraft will see us? And you're saying you don't, you don't know. But well, is... I don't, I don't know currently. I know in the past, and this was before, okay, really when ADSB just started. But if they're in a MOA, they probably are still communicating with the controller, and the controller will still try to uh, tell them about traffic. But it's not a hundred percent guaranteed. And sometimes in a MOA, you know, you're just busy with other stuff as a military aircraft, or um, maybe they don't even see you on radar, depending upon your altitude. I can feel it a little bit, is John Barry. Military aircraft will not transmit on ADSB if they wish to be unobserved, so they can turn it on. But in most cases today, technical military aircraft are not ADSB equipped and can choose to uh, disable transmissions. <clears throat> Obviously, you wouldn't want that in a combat zone. So if they do have it, they can turn it off. But uh, most tactical aircraft, meaning fighter, do not have it. Do they see us or do they, I mean, I guess that. Well, you, you can see, you can see mode S and uh, on the um, transponder and they have radar uh, that gives them warning depending on what kind of aircraft it is. So uh, I would say yes, but they're using other systems to be able to do that. My, my understanding is that the, the IFF system will see a mode S transponder like, like John said. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of questions. There, there's thank you for the uh, text um, or chat clarifications and questions. Uh, yes, UAD exists uh, largely due to cost advantage for GA. Um, one question here, I, I do have the answer for. Can iPad be connected wirelessly to Club Aircraft Power Form as an additional display? Yes and no. The PowerForm Fusion, which the 505 is now equipped with, uh, has a Bluetooth um, transmitter in it. And you, yes, you can use an iPad uh, with relevant software. And I don't know what software you need to run it, but you can uh, talk to that um, in theory with, with that Bluetooth system. Now there there's, is probably password protected and once you get into the system to, to coordinate, that, that also uh, potentially gives you um, access to change stuff like the config file and so forth. So I think when it comes to the fusion, technically it's possible. This is a policy decision that the club has yet to, uh, I think, uh, agree on. Excellent question. And I, I do not know where the nearest uh, ADSB ground a station is to Boulder? I can answer that. Uh, there's one station between Greeley and Fort Collins along 34. There's two co-located stations at DIA and I'm seeing uh, typical uh, ADSR from the UAT targets down to about 500 feet over Boulder. So it seems to be working pretty well there. Yeah, and that's, is that addressing the question about whether ADSR TISB works? That that was one of the chat questions that came in. What 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 have you found so far, Bob, in the in the beta testing? It, it works fine, and and I'm running a beta test on the um, alarms for it, and getting good alarms and in a real time basis with the UAT targets. So it, uh, it I think it's going to probably be released pretty soon. And all, all, all four of our club aircraft have the uh, TISB uh, ADSR license on, on installed on those, and they're working right now. Well, I, I, I should go back. The uh, K21 is almost installed. It, it's not fully operational yet, but it will be within the next few days. Most of the hardware installs done and just have a little bit more to do on that. Uh, so that's where it is. 
good good questions. And that's all the chat that I that I know how to address. Okay. Hey, Armin. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Alster. Are you uh, are you ready to uh, proceed with your uh, with your uh, presentation? Sure. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, we see you too. Thanks for getting Excellent. the camera. <laughs> Let's see if this works. Uh, okay. Yep, Does working. The, uh, screen share up here. There you go. Looks awesome. good. Well, I'll try to keep this uh, short and sweet and try to make it as interactive as possible. So at any time, if you guys have any questions, feel free to just chime in and ask. So as you guys know, our aircraft are incredibly complex pieces of equipment. We have a lot of radio stuff going on. In many cases, we have multiple GPS receivers. We have to form, like Bill discussed, ELTs for emergencies, these here for voice, ADSB, and on and on and on. One of the things that every piece of equipment listed here has in common is that it needs an antenna to get energy out of the system or into the system and transmit or receive that to the air. We use antennas for that. But what are some of the key parameters when dealing with antennas? And obviously it's the operating frequency or center one. There's something called the radiation pattern, where the energy goes, polarization, how the electric field moves and on a so we got characteristic impedance, active pass antennas, connections, and some installation concerns. So the resonant frequency. Most of our antennas are not wideband antennas. They only really work well at a narrow range of frequencies. And you can see a key example of that in this GPS antenna. So if we take a look at the graph on the left, the left it's called. Can you hear me now? Any better? Kurt? Sorry, I got a message here. People can't hear me. Yeah, if you speak a bit louder, I think it works better. OK. So we have the graph on the left indicating something called return loss. So what that is, is essentially we transmit energy into the antenna, and then we measure what comes out of the antenna as a reflection. The lower that number is, the better for us, because that means one of two things, that energy is going out into free space, or it's being dissipated as heat in the antenna. The latter is undesirable. We want that energy to go out. But for this GPS antenna, you can see that near that red line, most of the energy is being broadcast to the environment. We want that. What we don't want are, is anything that shifts that transmit frequency to the left or to the right. This stuff being human bodies or anomalies in the installation. You can see that if and we shift that at any point, we'll have a large decrease in overall efficiency. The next thing we need to be concerned about is how the antenna is designed to interact with its environment. Where is it directing that radiation? So we can see this GPS antenna again. We've all probably seen these GPS pucks, these little ceramic pieces. They're really designed to transmit and receive from the face of this antenna. Right? You can see that pattern indicated on the right. When we install them in the aircraft, we want that facing up because for the most part, we're not really flying upside down. If we install it at an angle, it very rapidly degrades the received performance of this system. Another key example is FLARM. I'm sure we've all seen these images of the power farm and its various antenna installations. So time for some audio and feedback. Where would we stand if we want to get the most, the greatest range? One, two, or three? Just shout it out. Well, two. two is good. Three. Two. All right. When we take a look at what the, the pattern looks like, you're right. Point two. These side pole antennas tend to have nulls along the axis. So if you've ever seen somebody point an antenna, like a dipole antenna, and point it the tip to the target, they're basically putting it in the antenna's blind spot. We're down 15 decibels when we do that in many dipole antennas. But around the antenna, it's installed vertically. It's pretty uniform. One of the other key important parameters is uh, something called characteristic impedance. What this really means is since light or radio waves is an electromagnetic waves, it's the ratio 
of the magnetic field to the electric field. And we have a reflection whenever we change that. What does it mean in practice for us? It means in practice that most of our systems are designed for that ratio to be 50. Whenever we change that ratio in an undesirable way, we lose energy. What are some of the ways we change that ratio? Let's say you have the antenna on cable. If we kink the cable or bend it too much, we create a change in that value and we lose energy doing that. So we need to be very careful when we're installing these cables. When we have another characteristic impedance change, when we try to operate equipment without antennas attached, that can be extremely dangerous for our equipment. Why? Because whenever we have that mismatch, we have a reflection. And in many cases, the energy reflected can be up to twice the voltage of the energy transmitted. So let's say we have a UHF radio and we try to key the mic button to test the system. It's very possible to damage the transmitter because that energy is going to bounce back from that open connection. If we don't have the antenna and then fire our transmitter. I'm sure we've also seen these uh, GPS pucks, right? In many cases, they're what's known as active antennas. That is to say, they need power applied to them in order to effectively receive or receive anything at all. And this power goes out over the center conductor in that connection there. If you try to run one of these active antennas, even if it says, oh, GPS antenna, and you hook it up to your GPS receiver without applying that power to it, you're not going to get anything. One of the key things to do is to take a look at your piece of equipment that's supposed to be receiving the signal. You just take a multimeter and attach it to the semiconductor and the, the ground plane sheet and see if you're actually getting power over this, over this conductor. So you can match the right antennas to the right pieces of equipment. Generally, it's a good idea to use whatever you get in the box, but oftentimes that's not possible. Oftentimes, for an installation into your particular ship, you need to make certain concessions. And uh, this is one of those. Sorry, I see a question here. Uh, do you know if the ceramic GPS units have an external connection? Do you have the same issue with no antenna connected? Does GPS detect external antenna connected and use internal if not connected to avoid damage? Um, GPS is generally a receive only. So you don't have that high power transmit. So even if you have a reflection, you're not going to damage anything. Connectors and cables, all right? So the energy has to get to the antenna somehow. And one of the key mistakes I see a lot of people making is using too much cable or the wrong type of cable. I mean, it's very often for us to get cables that are far too long for our applications. But we have to bear in mind that these cables aren't lossless. When you send electromagnetic energy down this cable, you're going to lose some of it at the other end. And in some cases, it can be shocking how much you lose. A key example of that is, you know, this RG400 coax. That is the one of some of the standard double shielded coax that we use for UHF communications. Let's say we were running a higher frequency through that let's say something like GPS at 1.575 uh, gigahertz. If we were running it from the nose of the aircraft to the tail, that's typically something like 22 feet. We're gonna lose over half our signal strength by doing that. Mm. So it's important to use as much cable as you need and try to avoid using more. And it can be kind of intimidating to try to cut these connectors, cut the cable and trim it but it's actually fairly straightforward. We have some tools here that we can use and it's available to the club to, to accomplish this. So straight wire cutters up the end. There's a tool like this. This is a coax stripper. It will remove the sheath, the external sheath, trim the ground braid within the cable and trim the dielectric around the center conductor. You just put it on, spin it, pull it off, and then you can go online and acquire the parts to build your own connectors. So little pins like that serve as the center conductor. You have the housing for your new connector. 
and you have a ferrule to crimp. So they just go together like that. The center conductor gets inserted. And it's a crimp tool like this. It's a ratcheting coax crimp tool. Just squeeze it and we're back in business. And we're not throwing away some of our precious signal in unnecessary cable. Hey, uh, let's start, uh, Charlie, I have a question for you. Do you yeah. have an opinion on antenna combiners? So antenna combiners are great things. And I see a lot of people using them for GPS because a lot of our equipment needs individual GPS inputs like FLARM tends to need it. The ADSB systems need it. Our NAV computers need it. Um, it should be noted though that oftentimes antenna combiners will be resistive dividers. Right. That's one way of doing it. The other way is something called a quarter wave, like a Wilkinson divider. Um, you will lose signal strength. So if you have a single GPS antenna going in, two going out, and it's not an active system, your signal at each of these ports is something called 3 dB down. It's half the signal strength. Luckily, we have a lot of signal strength, and GPS signals can typically be tracked at negative 165 dBm. Um, but you need a mega of 140 to acquire, and you typically have more than 20 dB of margin there. So it's possible, generally not advisable in challenging RF situations. I'm not sure if that answers your question. So follow up for you. So of all of these antennas, our, we have little antenna farms in our gliders now. <laughs> Which ones should never be next to each other if there is such a uh, circumstance? So GPS signals are pretty weak. I would avoid putting transmit anything near GPS receivers. So GPS receivers often have these low noise amplifiers in them that are very easily swamped. So basically the little amplifier will try to amplify the signal, but it'll be saturated. It's like, you know, it's the output signal is all the way at 11, and it can't hear the very weak GPS signal. Other things to avoid include putting transponder antennas, like the Mode S and ADSD antennas, near anything else. And the reason for that is the transit power on, like, a, I think it's a class one uh, transponder is fairly high, it's like 250 watts. Now it's not continuous, it's pulsed, but you'll often pick that up in things like uh, VHF radios and it can interfere with flight computers and your GPS. So I recommend keeping that kind of far away from everything else. So Terry says, uh, give us an example of distance. So I'd recommend getting it out of what's known as the near field. So antennas tend to have something called the near field and the far field. Um, the near field will be inductive coupling or when the shape of the radiation can be approximated by like a, a sphere if you have a, like a point transmitter. And the far field is often where it's like defined as a plane. So one or two wavelengths would be a, a useful rule of thumb. So you divide the speed of light by the transmit frequency and put it that far away at a minimum. Connectors and cables. You know, we've probably all been here. Right? We wanted to put a different antenna on something and it won't fit. Again, we can use fairly basic tools like this to put the right connector on things if we really have to. But it should be noted that not all connectors are made the same. Not all connectors are equal in terms of performance. And not all connectors are equal in terms of ease of use. So we've often seen with the radios, we have these things called B and Cs, connectors just like this, where you just have a ferrule that you put on here and twist like 90 degrees. Those are often the easiest to install and remove. Uh, the SMA connectors, the ones that are shown in this presentation here, um, do require a bit more care to use. They're smaller, which is great for installation in our ships. But a lot of times people will just put them finger tight. And that's typically not good enough to get 
reliable, repeatable results. They make these special torque wrenches that torque these things down to eight inch pounds. And it's highly recommended that if you're gonna be using these connectors, these SMA connectors, that you get one of those wrenches and probably get one to the club. And we use these connectors at that right torque, prevents them from being loose and creates uh, the right impedance match. Hmm. Fuselage materials. You know, this, this section is basically some of the concerns that people run into in the installation. Carbon fiber is great. Love this stuff, but it creates certain unique challenges from an RF perspective because it is model conductive. It's not a great ground plane because it is model conductive. It's not a great conductor, but it presents enough of a uh, low, uh, for instance, a low enough electrical resistance so that we can't effectively transmit through it. So a lot of our antennas have to be installed external to the aircraft. And it sucks, but unfortunately it requires, in many cases, drilling through the, the airframe. And remember Armand in the transponder installation, he, if you don't mind Armand, we have a antenna on the right here that's kind of similar to what you got in the ship, correct? Yeah. Anyway, so, in a fiberglass aircraft, you can basically put the antennas in a situation like you see in the lower right hand side of this slide here. You can install them inside the aircraft. It's fairly straightforward. This is a uh, monopole antenna with a ground plane, that pie plate looking dish that serves as a reflector. So it's kind of like a mirror for that antenna. It creates that nice radiation pattern. But if you install that on the inside of a carbon fiber ship, like the Ventus 2, Ventus 3, some of the newer ships, you won't really have effective transmission. So that's why a lot of people tend to use the antennas to see on the lower left. These are those sharpening antennas that are installed and radiate external to the aircraft. So you can get away from the waveband structure that's basically a, a fuselage of a, of a cell plane. The next thing to deal with is human detuning. We are mainly bags of water, for better or worse. The problem is that water's relative dielectric constant is 88 compared with something like air, which is right around one. And it creates a massive shift in the center frequency of an antenna when you're near it. I'm sure we all remember the whole you know, iPhone debacle of you're holding it wrong. It's a key example of that. We get the human body too close to the antenna and you can shift its resonant frequency by tens to hundreds of megahertz. And if you think about that earlier slide where the resonant point of that antenna was right around 1.575 and the bandwidth was something like 40 megahertz. If you shift that by a couple hundred megahertz, now our GPS doesn't really work anymore. Same thing with ADS-B or any of the radios or any of the other transponder systems. So it's important to keep the antennas probably uh, away from the two, away from the human body. A lot of people put their, you know, ADSB antennas up front on the, on the canopy. Well, our knees are really close to that. Some people put an antenna uh, for their uh, transponders by their feet. And going to bed, you'll see a massive performance shift as you wiggle your feet on the cockpit. Proximity to other systems. You know, that was one of the questions earlier. There's a club member where you can hear the, every time the transponder fires, you can hear it click in the radio. Increasing the separation, it could easily resolve that issue. And then there's the ground plane requirements. That's that pie plane looking thing. Oftentimes in carbon fiber ships, it's essential to have an additional ground plane because the carbon fiber is a pretty poor conductor. And in a fiberglass ship, if you're using this type of antenna, that's on the lower right, it's essential to have a ground plane. Not all antennas require ground planes. So it's basically boils down to check the data sheet. Do we have any questions? Yeah, Alistair, what's your opinion on the dipole antennas that come with the farm? I'd have to do, uh, I'd have to get one of those antennas and hook it up to a piece of equipment called a DNA and do a spin. Generally, I think they're fine. The big problems arise with improper installation. So if we take this antenna and we mount it on a piece of metal, well, we're 
couple into that piece of metal and we're detuning the antenna. If we take this thing and we you know, angle it the wrong way, let's say this is our transmit antenna and this is our receive antenna, and we twist one like that, we'll run into a situation where you have cross polarization. You can lose like 20 dB, 30 dB. It's like a thousand to one uh, sort of ratio there of energy. So the antennas are fine. The installation can make a break. So. Is there any uh, harm to your endocrine system from this radiation? I wouldn't worry about it, generally. The amount of power transmitted, like the highest transmit power that we have, pulsed power is that transponder. Um, continuous wave, it's fairly low. It's going to take a lot of energy to, and a lot of exposure to, to really harm the And it's non ionizing radiation. So basically, it doesn't have enough energy to damage DNA. Other questions, comments? Okay, I'll keep piling on here. So, <laughs> um, so the new fusion, the Flarm fusions have transmit capability in the Flarm B as, um, as Bill described. What, can you um, estimate what a good distance between those two? Could you have them in the interior cockpit on either side of the canopy? That's one way of doing that. Um, so, this A and B antenna, it's called uh, primary and diversity antennas. Essentially what it boils down to is if you can imagine the electromagnetic field around, well, anywhere really, as an ocean with waves, there is gonna be some places in the ocean where you have peaks, high energy, and some places in the ocean where you have troughs, low energy. By separating the antennas, the hope is that one can be in a peak and one can be in a trough if there is a trough. So I would recommend no less than a quarter wavelength. So take your transmit frequency, take the speed of light, divided by your transmit frequency, multiply that by a quarter, and increase the separation by that distance. Um, the recommendation I've heard about the B antenna is on, on a carbon aircraft, for example, mount that um, on the belly uh, of the aircraft such that you have uh, transmission and reception uh, behind and beneath the aircraft, whereas your carbon aircraft would completely screen the, the well, not completely, mm -hmm. but somewhat screen the A antenna, which is up in front of your, or, or in your glare shield in your cockpit. That's excellent advice. That would require that you have an exterior antenna on your B, though. Drill, baby, drill. <laughs> so there is another message here. When shortening antenna cables, is there a right length for any length? I would say that my personal opinion is use the length needed to get to your location and just a little bit more for the ability to disconnect things without creating excessive kinking in the cable. But when we're passing RF through something, especially coax cables, we're gonna have loss. So minimize the loss, use what you need, and not much more. <clears throat> Alistair, I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, and this is near and dear to my heart. Given the valley of tears that I walked through to get my flarm functioning, could you, could you suggest and, and maybe now is not the right time, but perhaps uh, suggest a, a method to systematically uh, diag troubleshoot, diagnose the flarm system that I assume would start with and uh, verifying the antennas are working and then getting back and, and, and basically isolating the different um, components of the system and such that we can have a methodical way to troubleshoot rather than guessing and hoping. Yeah, so a lot of this boils down to the equipment we have available. One of the key pieces of equipment would be something called the VNA, a vector network analyzer. It's the thing that makes those graphs that you saw with the GPS uh, antenna, that return loss. If we install the antennas in the aircraft and we know the transmit frequency that we want, we can basically disconnect that antenna from that piece of equipment 
and test with the DNA to measure the return lens. And this will validate the insulation from that point where it connects to that box all the way out to the antenna. So that's cable and antenna and connector. Uh, the next thing to do would be to use something called a spectrum analyzer to measure the transmit. If we're talking about ADSB, we want to validate that it's actually transmitting at a certain power level on that connection. And then hook the two up together and then use either another aircraft or take the power farm system, like those portable farms, and go to the end of the runway and let's see what you can see. So there's, there's a method to do it. And I think uh, like a lot of the avionics guys should have the requisite tools to go and do this test. Where, where, where are we going to get a spectrum? I mean, that's a $30,000 piece of kit. <laughs> So the people that do the transponder inspections, and they might have one. We should call them and uh, chat with them to see what's possible. When it comes to spectrum analyzers, though, there are a lot of open source radios, SDRs, that can be had for like $100, $200, that can tune into this. So there's actually a $25 TV tuner that can receive ADS-B. And that'll be sufficient for measuring the sequel transmitter. I think a classic one is something called RTL SDR. Well, I'll follow up with you online because I, I, I'm thinking we, we, it would be great to have a tool in the club where somebody could, could use this tool in a procedure to, um, if you think you're having flarm problems, for example, run the procedure, use the equipment, and in, in an hour, you're going to know what your problem is or if you have a problem. Or, or you verify that it's working. Yep. So I just checked and here on Amazon, they actually have for $26.95 uh, software defined radio, an RTL SDR that should be able to pick up ADSB and transponder signals. What about flarm signals? It'll pick that up too. So we can hook this up to your flarm box to see if you're actually transmitting. Now it's not a calibrated instrument, but it's good enough to let us know, is it sending something at all? Okay. Any other questions? So uh, Ken Arnett has one. I think it yeah. may be a spectrum analyzer. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question for you, Alistair. Have you found a way to power a power form without doing it through another instrument? They have a very unique design where you have to power the box through one of its uh, ports whether it's the RJ45 or the DB9 port from another instrument. It should be possible to take that RJ45 and make a custom adapter, but I haven't seen such a, an, an adapter. Really. I've seen most people power it off of the other instruments, but it shouldn't be too hard to figure that out. And we can take a look at your particular solution and come up with a workable solution. You can power that directly through the DB9 uh, without any other instrument connected. Oh, fantastic. Thanks, Paul. Chair Bob, how do you do it? <laughs> uh, the color out uh, red is plus and white is negative. Put 12 volts on the DB9 and you'll be powered up. Uh, works real well. Sounds good, thanks. Is that what I have, Bob? <laughs> uh, I'll have to look at your installation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I'm, yeah, I, I think the I think this is all great stuff. I, I I'm still struggling. I'm just I'm just too ignorant for a lot of these things, unfortunately. And it would just be as 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 Bill said. I think it would be just really good to be able to. Um, have kind of a checklist or some toolkit or something where you look at the installation of someone and say, you know, what what are the, you know, practically speaking, what are the things I need to 
take care of to improve it. You know, the, the antennas are too close or the cables are too long or the, uh, the, they're not installed right or, you know, practically speaking, how, how can we help people uh, you know, and myself, for example, uh, how, how can we make this practical so that I now now know what to do? Because I still don't know what to do. Fair enough. I'm, I'm sure that uh, one of the things that we can probably do is a range of things where we, you know, are all out of the field and we take a look at the installation and point out rules of thumb and tips and tricks for each person's custom installation because all of our ships, they're wonderful machines, but they're all very unique. And it's hard to come up with a single rule of thumb that applies to everybody's unique yeah. circumstance. Yeah, no, I get that, yeah. yeah. All right, um, does anybody have anything else? Um, if not- hey, I Alistair? Know. Yeah, I just, I, I just need Alistair's phone number. I think that's the solution to any of my- <laughs> Oh, the size of that torque wrench. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Alistair, I think it's gonna it's gonna disappear for a while because <laughs> everyone's gonna, everyone's gonna give him a call. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, at any rate, uh, uh, Alistair, thanks so much. Uh, uh, Bill, thanks so much. I, I think one thing, uh, and, and if you're ready to, to close this out, um, close out the screen, Alistair, we can go back to seeing everybody again. Great, thanks. Um, one thing, you know, I, I, I think this ground school really emphasizes is the talent that we have within our club. Um, we have a lot of people who have a lot of different talent and, and the talent runs really deep. Uh, the knowledge base runs really deep. We're, we're doing something, you know, pretty sophisticated here um, in terms of uh, all the soaring and the equipment that we have to use, uh, or we don't have to, but we're able to use now in the, the 21st century uh, to do our soaring. And just what a wonderful resource we have with each other in this club. And, and you know, I, I bought a 20 year old glider and it's a great glider to Venice too, but you know, it, it needed a whole new panel. Um, I was able to do some of it myself, but Alistair gave me some great help. Uh, a few other people just gave me some tremendous help. And, and it being a, an experimental ship, I was able to pretty much get it together. Um, and th then just recently I, I put new seals in, in the wings. I didn't, um, you know, uh, Scott Westfall just really helped me out and, 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 and so did uh, Richard Hall. And the resource we have in this club is just wonderful. And it's so deep and so wide. Uh, we've got such a great bunch of, uh, of, of folks here, pilots uh, with extensive knowledge and, uh, so it, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit choked up, I guess, about um, how uh, the talent that we have in this club that, and, and the way everybody's willing to share it. Uh, Joe Brock, you know, I see him sitting there. He's um, putting, it, putting our, uh, uh, our, our uh, you know, radio in, our sh in the shack so that we can all hear what's going on. Uh, Colin's putting in the, the OGN system. Um, terrific, you know, so. I just want to take a moment to thank everybody in the club for all that you do for the club. Bob Ferris does a wonderful job and 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 just doing so much for the for the gliders um, and, and instruction and all that. Uh, Clemens is uh, tremendous, giving tremendous business acumen to the club. Uh, he may not be the best mechanic we have, but uh, he's he's a great businessman and, and really doing wonderful things. So. Uh, I'm seeing so many people contribute in so many ways. So I, I just want to take a moment and thank everybody for what you're doing for the club. And, and uh, I think we, we just have a tremendous club. And so thanks everyone. 
Yeah, no, thank you, Armand, for leading this ground school. And I mean, I, I just echo everything you just said. I mean, I, if it weren't for the people <laughs> that we have in the club, I think my my glider would still sit on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and then you know, the problem here in 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 saying this is is omission and and omitting all the wonderful things. You know, I'm just thinking, um, uh, you know, Gary Stubbe rebuilt. I mean completely rebuilt, not rebuilt, we're just completely redid our tow plane. Um, you know, the things that we have, uh, it's just great. So uh, we're about to start soaring season. And uh, so we're all kind of pulling together. And and uh, so we look forward to everybody continuing to help and pitch in and, and, and make SSB the great uh, club that it is. So yeah the, yeah, the mentoring is more than just a control stick. It's all the things you were just talking about and Alistair's talent and everything. Uh, there's a whole mentor side of the ground that's on the ground and on the dirt and it's not just the air. Yeah, and you know, even uh, people coming out that are sitting on the picnic table and uh, somebody overshoots, you know, it has a long landing and they run out and get them and pull the ship back and uh, yeah, great camaraderie. Uh, so, at any rate, uh, uh, thanks everybody uh, for what you do, and thanks especially to Alistair and and Bill for giving this presentation tonight. Um, I, I certainly would not have been able to give this presentation. So, uh, thanks so much. And uh, uh, with that, I'm just going to say good night. Otherwise, I might you know get more choked up and start to cry. So. Uh, <laughs> I've got a comment. Uh, really uh, all somebody have a comment? Yeah, the league, the uh, OLC league starts this weekend, 17th, 18th, first league racing weekend of the 19 weekend season. So come out and fly. It looks like Saturday may be a little snowy and rainy, but Sunday <laughs> looks like it's salvageable. So let's go out and get some points. Oh, also, Charlie had a question about wavelength uh, calculations. So uh, speed of light is three times 10 to the 10th centimeters a second. Divide that by the frequency, which on FLARM is 916 times 10 to the six uh, cycles. And that'll give you your wavelength in centimeters. So you can do your calculations from that. You know, I, I knew that, Bob. I was just going to let somebody else say it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody laughs. Bob, Bob you, you inspire us on OLC weekends. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so how many wave how many wavelengths are we gonna fly on the weekend? That's the question. <laughs> Say goodnight, Bob. Sorry, Bob.